Good afternoon. This is Kathleen Drew, Chair of the Energy Facility Site Evaluation Council, calling our March 15th monthly meeting to order. Ms. Grantham, will you call the roll? Certainly. Department of Commerce. Hey, Kelly, present. Department of Ecology. Eli Levitt, present. Department of Fish and Wildlife. Department of Natural Resources. Lenny Young, present. Utilities and Transportation Commission. Casey Brewster, present. Local Government and Optional State Agencies. For the Horse Heaven Project, Department of Agriculture, Derek Sanderson. For Benton County, Ed Brost. For the Badger Mountain Project, Douglas County. For the Watoma Solar Project, for Benton, Benton County, County, Dave Sharp. Dave Sharp. I know Dave was here. Um, if you have an open mic, can you please make sure to mute? I heard a small echo. Um, for the Watoma Solar Project, Washington State Department of Transportation. Paul Gunseth here. For Dave the Sharp Hill. checking in. Dave Sharp checking in late. Thank you, Dave. For the Hop Hill Project for Benton County, Paul Krupen. Present. The Assistant Attorney Generals, John Thompson. Present. Jenna Slocum. Present. Administrative Law Judges, Adam Torum. Here and off mute for this purpose. <laughs> Thank you. Laura Bradley. Judge Bradley couldn't attend today. Okay, uh, and was that Dan Gerard? It was, Judge Gerard, yes. Thank you. For FSEC staff, Sonia Bumpus. Amy Hofgemeyer. Amy Hofgemeyer, present. Amy Moon. Amy Moon, present. Stu Henderson. Uh, Joan Owens is present. Dave Walker. Stu, and Stu oh. Henderson here. Thank you, Stu. Dave Walker. Dave Walker, present. Sonia Scabland. Ms. Scabland, present. Lisa Massengale. Lisa Massengale, present. Sarah Randolph. Sarah Randolph, present. Sean Green. Sean Green, present. Lance Caputo. Lance Caputo, present. John Barnes. John Barnes, present. Osta Davis. Osta Davis, present. Joanne Snarsky. Joanne Snarsky, present. For the operational updates, Kittitas Valley Wind Project. Eric Malbardis, present. Wild Horse Wind Power Project. Jennifer Galbraith, present. Grace Harbor Energy Center. Chris Shahalis, Shahalis, present. For Grace Harbor thank, Energy Center. Thank you. Shahalis Generation Facility. Mike Adams, present. Columbia Generating Station. Present. Columbia Solar. Thomas Cushing, present. And do we have someone for the Council for the Environment? Chair, there is a quorum for the regular Council, the Watoma Solar Council, and the Hop Hill Council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's an echo. Moving on to the proposed agenda. There's a proposed agenda in front of you, council members. Um, is there a motion to adopt the proposed agenda? So moved, Lenny Young. Thank you. Second? Second, Kate Kelly. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The uh, agenda is adopted. Moving on to the meeting minutes for February 15th, 2023. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Stacey Brewster, motion to approve the meeting minutes from February 15th, 2023. Thank you. Second? 
Okay, Kelly, second. Thank you. I have a few changes for the uh, meeting minutes on page eight. Line eight. The word continued should be the word conditional. On page 11, line 16. The word S-I-F-C-O-R should be Pacific Core, P-A-C-I-F-I-C-O-R-P. Page 12, line 23 is correct. Page 18, line, just checking, line 14, the word Tacoma should be the letters capital T, capital A, capital C. Page 28, line 22, a cumulative should be cumulative. Those are the corrections that I have. Are there any other corrections? Hearing none, all those uh, in favor of approving the uh, minutes as amended, please say aye. 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 Opposed, the minutes are approved. On to our operating facilities reports. Kittitas Valley Wind Project, Mr. Melbardis, is he on? Good afternoon, Chair Drew, FSEC Council and staff. Uh, for the record, this is Eric Melbardis with EDP Renewables for the Kittitas Valley Wind Power Project. And we had nothing non-routine to report. Thank you. Wild Horse Wind Power Project, Ms. Galbraith. Yes, thank you, Chair Drew, Council members and staff. This is Jennifer Galbraith with Puget Sound Energy representing the Wild Horse Wind Facility. And I have nothing non-routine to report for the month of February. Thank you. Okay, moving on to Chehalis Generation Facility, Mr. Adams. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Drew, FSEC, Council and staff. Uh, for the record, this is Mike Adams, Plant Manager um, representing Chehalis Generation Facility. Uh, for the month of February 2023, I have nothing non-routine to report. Okay, thank you. Grays Harbor Energy Center, Mr. Sharon. Afternoon, Chair Drew, Council members, FSEC staff. Um, this is Chris Sharon, Plant Manager, Grays Harbor Energy Center. And for the month of February, I also have nothing non-routine to report. Columbia Generating Station. Good afternoon, Chair Drew, Council members, and FSEC, FSEC staff. This is Mary Ramos reporting for Energy Northwest. For the month of February, I have two items to report for Columbia Generating Station. The first item is regarding an NPDES noncompliance. On February 21st, Energy Northwest discovered that a flow meter calibration required under the Columbia Generating Station National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit exceeded the required annual calibration time frame. Uh, the uh, calibration, the task to calibrate the flow meter was inadvertently closed due to human performance errors. The flow meter tracks potable water backwash to the on-site evaporation ponds and in no way impacts any discharge to the environment. Uh, the device was calibrated on March 2nd and was found to be within specification and did not require adjustment. We are um, uh, evaluating additional corrective actions to prevent recurrence of this human performance error. And we're also evaluating if um, any additional um, tasks were inadvertently closed, but so far we have not found any. Um, this was reported in the February Discharge Monitoring Report, which was submitted to FSEC uh, yesterday. The second item I have to report for Columbia Generating Station is regarding our Building 194 Paint and Blast Shop. This uh, Paint and Blast Shop is governed under FSEC Order 837. And during calendar year 2022, 
uh, we exceeded the small quantity emission rate for one chemical under that permit. Um, the, the, essentially, the emission rate limit is 0 0.02 pounds per hour um, under that FSEC order. And our calculated maximum emission rate for calendar year 22 was 0.054 pounds per hour. This permit exceedance is also a result of human performance error. Uh, paint shop personnel did not follow the procedure to validate chemical consumption limits prior to using the paint products. Uh, similar to the uh, item I noted earlier, we are um, evaluating additional corrective actions to prevent recurrence, uh, such as retraining of paint shop personnel, and then also reevaluating the list of items or paint products used at that facility. Uh, this noncompliance was reported in the 2022 Air Emission Source Registration for Columbia Generating Station. Are there any questions uh, for me? Thank you. Are there any questions from council members? Uh, Chair, this is uh, Lenny Young. I have one question for Ms. Ramos. Go ahead. Uh, could you briefly explain what potable water backwash means? What's the what's a, a plain language explanation of what that is? Oh, it, we have a, 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 pot of, a flocculator building. It's essentially this flow meter tracks um, the uh, backwash coming from our flocculator building uh, to our on-site evaporation ponds. What What do you mean by backwash? Um, it is essentially um, trying to I'm drawing a blank on the words. Um, it is essentially part of the cleaning process from our uh, potable water system. Okay, so water that is in the potable system somehow gets exited into the evaporating ponds. Is that right? Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. We now are moving on to, uh, we have two uh, resolutions in front of us. The first one, resolution number 299, amendment number one, the cooling system sediment disposal. And uh, it is in front of you now, it's been in our packets. Before we move on to consider this item, I'd like to ask if there's anyone who would like to comment from the public on this resolution. Please raise your hand or open your mic to ask to be recognized. Okay, at this point, we're not hearing that there's anyone who would like to speak um, and provide us with public comment on re resolution number 299. I guess I should have asked for the staff, sorry about that, Ms. Moon to go ahead and give us um, the briefing on this. Oh, thank you, Chair Drew. <laughs> um, so oh, good afternoon. Boy. Yeah, good afternoon, Chair Drew and other council members. For the record, this is Amy Moon, an FSEC staff member. And this will be kind of a repeat of what Chair Drew just said, but I want to introduce to you the two proposed resolutions that have been updated to reflect a dosimeter change as presented to you at the last council meeting on February 15th, 2023. As I presented last month, Resolution 299 is the Columbia Generating Station Cooling System Sediment Disposal. That's what the resolution deals with. And then Resolution 332 is for the Columbia Generating Station Radiological Environmental Monitoring Program. As I presented last month, the radionuclide air monitoring in both resolutions was historically done using thermoluminescent dosimeters, or TLDs. The dose measurement technology has evolved, and the more recent technology uses optically stimulated luminescence, or OSL, dosimeters. The updated resolutions included in your council packet reflect that change to OSL do dosimeters. 
The change in dosimeters will continue to meet the Nuclear Regulatory Commission requirements as published in the NRC Regulatory Guide 4.13 for environmental dosimetry, including meeting the American National Standards Institute performance testing and procedural specifications for dosimetry environmental applications. The NRC approved the license basis documents, which noted the change from thermoluminescence dosimeters to op optically stimulated luminescence dosimeters. In addition, the Washington Department of Health provides technical oversight for the Radiological Environmental Monitoring Program. We also use the acronym REMP or REMP and is aware of the dosimeter update and has no concerns or ob objections. So as Chair Drew brought to your attention, the updated resolution 299 amendment one, and then the, the next one that she was about to introduce is resolution 332 amendment one, are included in the council packet for your consideration. And are there any questions on those resolutions? Any questions from council members? Okay, before we move to take action, I will try this once again now that the public may know now what we are actually talking about. Um, so are there any public comments for either resolution 299 or uh, amendment number one or resolution number 332, amendment number one regarding the optically stimulated luminescence dosimeters? At this point, I don't think we have any public comment on either one of those. So if we would start uh, council members with resolution uh, number. Oh, go ahead. I see that Eli raised his hand. Eli Levitt, council or chairman. Oh, chair thank you. I don't have that Levitt. in front of me. <laughs> yeah. Council member Levitt. Thank you, Amy. <clears throat> this is Eli Levitt at Department of Ecology. I just wanted to reiterate, I believe from the last briefing, you said this change in the technology we're using is purely to monitor environmental impacts and is not related to human health or personnel safety. Is that correct? Right. This is part of the regional program that monitors air. So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they, of course, uh, have the authority over the, the stack emissions, basically what, what comes out from from um, producing the energy, but there's um, potential for um, uh, radi radiation energy, uh, to put it that way, out in the air. And so these air monitors collect that and the Department of Health monitors those. And so the, the monitoring is not being changed like the the fact that monitoring is being done will still continue to be done. It's just the type of um, monitor that's being used is being changed. And um, it's, uh, they're set at different intervals away from the, the uh, power plant. And it's, it's just part of the overall program that monitors air and um, food, um, Thanks. So that they, we know if there's any kind of environmental uh, issue that needs to be dealt with, with in, um, you know, in a fast manner that would be outside of something horrible like a meltdown. <laughs> Does that answer your question, Eli, or did I get too off track? No, I think so. I mean, yeah, it just reiterates it's not about, you know, like personnel safety. It's about no, gen right. general monitoring. Yeah, it's general monitoring for the outside world and the, the personnel monitoring. Uh, Mary Ramos could answer questions on that, but but there's in plant monitors that are different. So right. also, okay. thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and also to reiterate, this type of um, monitoring is a different technology, but has the same level of monitoring as has occurred in the past. Correct. It's a, it has the same level of monitoring. It's a different technology in which they can actually process the dosimeter more than once to, um, to look at the measurement. 
um, which may be necessary sometimes with uh, to double check something or to make sure there wasn't a laboratory error. Okay, thank you. Are there other council members with questions? Um, Madam Chair, this is Kate Kelly. Go ahead. Um, so my, I, I think, Amy, my question isn't directly related to the issue before us, but I'm just wondering, it sounds like this sediment is um, um, being disposed or stored and monitored on the property. And I'm, I understand that this is air quality monitoring, I think. Um, but it, is there something monitoring the, the underneath where the, the um, sediment is being stored as well? Uh, um, so there's multiple monitoring going on at the Columbia Generating Station, and these are both having to do with the air. So um, things get um, put into the air in different different ways, either it's it's um, falling from the sky because uh, these dosimeters are also picking up background sources like from just the earth's rocks and soils and the atmosphere cosmic rays. Um, but there's also water monitoring done. Um, the, the Department of Health is really in charge of that, but this is just one of one of the many ways that um, the radiological environmental monitoring program collects data that they use um, and the NRC uses it in um, uh, annual reports and it's this is all pretty standard stuff and you know I could invite somebody from Department of Health a physicist to come and give a presentation to the council at some point that might help uh, since I I don't know as much as they do about it. Um, but yeah, there's there's other sampling of um, of of things other than air, like you said, sludge and water. And then there's there's it goes way further than that, like the fish in the Columbia River and vegetables and milk products. Um, it It's really a comprehensive program. Did, thank does you. that answer I, your questions? It, it did, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you, um, and I think we can explore that um, to have a presentation sometime in the future that provides our council with a little, with some more background. Uh, a few years ago, we did have a tour of the Columbia Generating Station, but that was um, before most of the members who were on the council, and so that was very helpful at the time. Um, and we'd be happy to see how we can provide some of that um, information to the current council members who who were not yet um, with us at that time. Yes, th thank you, Chair Drew. That I think that would be really helpful to the council as well as the public if we could arrange at least for a presentation in this format, this hybrid format. And then at this time, I want to make the staff recommendation to the council to take a vote to approve the amended resolutions 299 and 332 as presented in your council packet. Thank you. Now we will move to um, council members resolution 299 and its attachment one. Is there a motion to amend Resolution number 299 and its attachment one to require full time monitoring of direct radiation by optically stimulated luminescence dosimeters as specified in attachment one to this resolution amendment. May I have a motion to approve this resolution? Motion Lenny to Young. approve. Oh, sorry, Lenny, Lenny Young, second. Nope, that's all right, Eli. Lenny Young, second. <laughs> That was Council Member Levitt who made the motion and Council Member Young who seconded it. Thank you very much. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is adopted. Moving on to resolution 332. 
and it's amendment one. It's a, excuse me, it's attachment one. Uh, the motion is the council hereby amends resolution number 332 and its attachment one to require full time monitoring of direct radiation by optically stimulated luminescence dosimeters as specified in attachment one to this amendment. In addition, the council hereby amends resolution number 332 attachment one table one groundwater monitoring wells. May I have a motion to approve that resolution? Eli Levitt, motion to approve. Thank you, second. Lenny Young, second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, resolution adopted. Thank you. Moving on to our next item. Um, we skipped through WNP one and four uh, non operational update. I believe unless it was combined with the. I think there are no um, outstanding items to report. Is that right, Ms. Romas? That's correct. I do not have any non routine items to report for WNP one and four. Thank you. OK, now we are on the Columbia Solar Projects. Mr. Cushing, Good welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Drew, Council members, SX staff. This is Thomas Cushing speaking on behalf of Columbia Solar. I'm taking over for Owen Hurd uh, from here on forward. And uh, Pensamon was completely operational this month. I mean, month of February, 591 megawatt hours. CAM is currently operational with 564 megawatt hours for February. Erica reached substantial completion February 8th and final completion March 2nd and produced 627 megawatt hours for February. Thank you. Moving on to the Horse Heaven Wind Farm project update, Ms. Moon. Good afternoon, Chair Drew and FSEC council members. Again, this is Amy Moon, FSEC staff member providing an update on the Horse Heaven Wind Project. FSEC staff continued to coordinate with our consultant, WSP, formerly known as Golder, reviewing comments uh, received during the draft environmental impact statement public comment period. And we have been developing data requests to assist in development and preparation of a final environmental impact statement. This additional information and analysis from the data requests will touch on several resource topics, including but not limited to air, noise and vibration, water and transportation. FSEC staff are also working on additional agency coordination that will inform the development and preparation of the final environmental impact statement. Does the council have any questions? Are there any questions from council members? OK, then um, moving on to the adjudication update. Yes, good Judge afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon, Chair Drew. I hope I can be heard both in the conference room you are in and over Microsoft Teams if something happens here as tends to bite me. I'll call back in and give the report. OK, thank you. As the council knows, we issued an order commencing adjudication back in mid-December of last year and set some deadlines in that for the petitions for intervention to come in. And they did last month on February 3rd, we had two different petitioners, the Yakima Tribe and Tri-Cities Cares, uh, a nonprofit organization over in Benton County with interests as alleged about the wind farm. We also got formal notices of participation from the applicant, Benton County and Council for the Environment. So we have five parties now uh, based on my order, preliminary order of intervention, allowing both Tri-Cities Cares and the Yakima Tribe to be parties to the adjudication, which is in the process of being scheduled for the Horse Heaven Wind project. We have a matter of scope of intervention to be determined. There was a limited objection from the applicant regarding the petition filed by Tri-Cities Cares. 
that has not yet been resolved. And as soon as we have a better idea of what the scope of the issues to be adjudicated might be, I'll be issuing a ruling on that question. On March 9th, I issued my preliminary order on intervention. It's pretty short. I hope it's concise and readable, but it does essentially what I just said. The following day, last Friday, March 10th of 2023, we conducted in the morning at 9 a.m. a two and a half hour pre-hearing conference. And we covered, um, in addition to a roll call, we covered six additional substantive items. And one of those is the question of venue. I know I talked with the FSEC manager yesterday about the current decision uh, that was made in, during COVID restrictions that this entire hearing would be held virtually. And I'm asking that the chair on behalf of at least three of the parties that have lobbied me to have you reconsider that decision. I'll be speaking more with them on March 20th about the questions and justifications for having a portion of the hearing in person or at least hybrid and asking them to submit those, their logic and rationale for the request to you in writing. So a full consideration can be made of how we're going to conduct this adjudication in the months ahead. We also talked about scheduling and the logistics that go into having an adjudication of this sort with pre-filed written testimony. And we may see written testimony come into the council and I'm advising all those council members listening that your reading homework is going to go up. So if you need to see your optometrist about reading glasses, now's a good time. But on April 10th, you might expect to see the first round of pre-filed testimony coming in from one or more parties. We'll be hammering away on the actual schedule itself on March 20th and hopefully come to some ideas for milestones and deadlines. Um, we are switching, if we can, as agreed by all the parties to electronic filing. So there won't be as much paper. Council for the Environment was certainly rooting for that. And we'll be coming up with some filing rules that make sense for our staff to handle all the electronic items and make sure that all the parties are serving each other. So everything's instant, timely, and less burdensome than the paper. If we have a need to accommodate someone who prefers paper copies amongst the council members, please let our staff know either um, Lisa Massengale or Andrea Grantham might be a good person to send an email to. And we'll make sure if you prefer um, written copies, hard copies of things that we can try to figure out a way whether to put that back on the filing parties or have staff get you what you need. I'm working today and hope to have a pre-hearing conference order filed out tomorrow that summarizes everything I've just told the council today, Chair Drew, and in that also give some further direction to the parties on how we expect the issues to be framed for the adjudication. Some of the submissions that came in lacked specificity and others lacked the appropriate tone of neutrality that I think the council expects to take it up and to review all of the evidence in these questions before us that are raised not only in the DEIS, but also the application itself and the tour that many members of the council took a few months ago. So I'm working to see if I can get past experience, both from the Vancouver Energy, the Whistling Ridge, and my personal experience as the judge in the Kittitas Valley and Wild Horse Wind projects to look at all those orders and how in practice the parties there cooperated to get to a, an agreement on, of all things, a disputed issues list. So if that's not a oxymoron, I don't know what is, but I am hurting the cats and trying to set expectations. And I hope that when the parties next meet, I think on Friday this week is what I'm informed to collaborate and prepare, we'll have a productive discussion next Monday afternoon at pre-hearing conference number two. You may have seen Joan Owens issue that notice earlier this week with the language about what we're gonna be doing next Monday. I think, um, Chair Drew, I'll stop there, but that should give you and all the council members a picture of what we're trying to do. We still have a July 8th deadline in which to make a recommendation to the governor. I've expressed some concern to staff about the timing that requires and for the writing deliberation and consideration that the council will have to go through. But until and unless the applicant files for another extension, out to the end of at least September. Um, 
it's going to be a tight statutory bound deadline for us to get done what the council needs to uh, and that may start as early as the first week of june more to come if you have questions i stand by thank you judge torum i do have a question from council member levitt um, or a, a comment to ensure that all of the filing parties have current email addresses and council member contact information are we receiving as council members filings directly from the parties or through you and the FSEC staff? That's an excellent question from Council Member Levitt. And my preference, subject always to the legal opinion of the esteemed and honorable Jonathan Thompson, is that for ex parte reasons, I think it's best that the parties not communicate directly with any member of the council, but that they continue to communicate through the adjudication email. Lisa Massengale has masterfully set up a system where every filing that comes in if sent to the proper email can be distributed accordingly based on what it is. So for a lot of the questions going around about deliberative process, procedural issues, we shouldn't be bothering you or the council members. And I'm not asking our parties to send those kind of items directly to you or any council member. When Lisa Massengale receives something that looks like it's uh, council member worthy, and we'll be getting into a list of those things as we get testimony pre-filed, certainly that'll be shipped directly, probably from staff is what I'm thinking. It'll come into the council email box and then be shipped separately as a staff tasking to filter what's coming in and what's appropriate for council. Anything that's coming in that's appropriate for the public, of course, is going up on the website. But I'm, I'm asking the council to read what you're supposed to read. Don't form your opinions early. And I think by filtering this way, we'll achieve a better chance to avoid any ex parte communications that might prejudice a council member and lead for a motion to exclude them from the deliberations and the decision, uh, at least as it goes into the recommendation to the governor. Perhaps I can bring Mr. Thompson into the conversation here and ask for his advice to the council members in terms of the pre-filed material that they will be receiving. Is this only for council members and not to be shared with other parties? Um, well, the testimony uh, will be served by each party on all of the other parties and then also distributed to the council members. So, um, you know, when the when a party's deadline for the filing of their pre-filed written testimony occurs, then, you know, every every party to the adjudication will have an opportunity to look at that and and formulate their responsive. Testimony. So that's not necessarily protected or confidential information when we receive it, but it is our responsibility not to share information or our thoughts or uh, any conversations about that material that we get with anyone um, else. Is that correct? Well, the 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 main concern with ex, with the restriction on ex parte contacts is against um, council members. So preside what, what are referred to as presiding uh, officers under the Administrative Procedure Act. Uh, the restriction on ex parte contacts is is um, that you not receive uh, information pertinent to the to the decision before you from other sources other than information that's gone through the filter of the adjudicative process. So um, certainly pre-filed testimony is, you know, goes through the, the filter of the adjudicative process. So um, and also um, there is a actually an exemption under the Open Public Meetings Act, which um, generally requires um, uh, members of a of a board or, or a council to to only uh, deliberate in, in at open public meetings. There's an exception to that when you're in an adjudication where you will have the opportunity to de deliberate with one another, um, not in an open meeting context about your recommendation to the governor based on what you hear in the adjudication. So that'll all kind of unfold in, in due course, but um, I hope that gives a General yes, I guess one of the questions I was trying to get at um, I, uh, to speak more directly is that none of the council members should be um, 
sharing their thoughts about the material that they're receiving with someone outside the council, for example, um, or having those kinds of conversations, which could lead to ex parte communication right, right, from right. that other party. Understood. Yeah. Maybe I'm, I didn't say that directly enough. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, certainly um, there's both the appearance of fairness and the uh, uh, ex parte contact restriction where, yeah, right, you wouldn't want to, uh, uh, you know, if folks are involved in uh, advocacy on another on another matter before the council, for example, to, you know, discuss the uh, that current case and, to, and, you know, engage in dialogue with people about um, about the case that they're sitting on. Yeah, and I'll chime in if I can now, Chair Drew. We, I think uh, several months back, I gave a brief presentation on what it meant to be a council member on an adjudication and promised a future training on ex parte contacts and how to handle all of these things. I think Judge Cassandra Noble in the past gave that presentation most recently, and I've got her materials. I want to update them, work with uh, AG John Thompson to make sure we have the most current ex parte rules under the APA and then give that presentation could be at a monthly meeting or could be at a special session. Um, that's up to you. I will also say that in the past when council members had an interaction with a party or perhaps were um, somebody approached them to talk about it, a adjudication that was ongoing or upcoming, they just on the record divulged that contact, made a record of the contact itself and stated whether or not they thought they could still be fair and impartial as their duties as a council member uh, making the recommendation to the governor under our 8050, 100 and 090 adjudication rules. So there are ways to cure these contacts. I don't want the council members to think they can't pick up the phone if somebody else in their agency who might be a witness in the proceeding calls them, but I think they should caution them that, hey, I'm the decision maker on, on a recommendation to the governor. I can't talk to you about that topic, but other agency business, certainly still fair game. They don't have to climb too high up the ivory tower, but those are the basic limits as uh, Mr. Thompson also described today. Thank you. That's that's helpful um, for all of us, including myself. This is our first adjudication, so we're um, trying to make sure we understand the responsibility and the the um, rules. And Mr. Young, you have your hand up. Yeah. Thank Thank you, Chair. Could staff remind us as to the status of SEPA work for this project and how that correlates to the timeline that Judge Torum just sketched out? Ms. Moon. Uh, so, as I stated in the update, SEPA, we completed the draft environmental impact statement. We had a public comment period that closed. Now we're reading all of those comments and um, taking, you know, heed of what the public had to say. And in order to develop the final environmental impact statement, there's plenty of work to be done of uh, additional analysis. And we haven't um, finalized that yet, and we haven't submitted any requests yet to the applicant. But that is part of the SEPA process. It, rather than um, just reissue a draft environmental impact statement and and stamp it as final, um, we we look at the public comments, we look at new information, we look at the updated application for site certification that the applicant submitted to us. And we have to process all of that, do additional SEPA work, like additional analysis, uh, produce a new document, the final environmental impact statement. And that also takes time, obviously. I do not have a clear estimate of how much time we think that will take. And I'm going to defer to Amy Hofkemeyer. She might be able to to speak on on that. Um, an additional, yeah, thank you. Um, and I'll call on Ms. Hofkemeyer. I think an additional piece of information for the council to know is that um, as we proceed further, we may have the um, adjudication running concurrently with finalizing the EIS, but we will not be coming to ask the council to make a final recommendation until all the pieces of information are before the council. Th um, thank and you, that, Chair. Yeah, that, that's go ahead. what I, 
that's what I was driving at is whether we would have the final EIS and uh, staff recommendation on in hand before we had to make a recommendation to the governor. Yes, yes. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Ms. Hofkamer? How, how tight how tight is that timing going to be? How much time would there be between we ha when we have a completed SEPA process and when we have to make a recommendation to the governor? Um, well, we certainly will need to work with the applicant and look at that July date, um, but uh, our deliberations on this complex pro project will need to take into consideration both those pieces as well as our consultation with the Yakima Nation, which I have an update on, right. but I will go ahead and let uh, Ms. Hofkemeyer also jump in here. Thank you, Chair Drew. Um, to speak to the timeline question, um, as we are reviewing the comments and establishing the remaining analysis and revisions that are intended for the final EIS uh, in response to comments received, uh, we are also working with our contractor and contracted agencies to develop um, a, a timeline of next steps and what we think that schedule will look like we're not ready to set that schedule yet. It's still in work. Um, and part of that will depend on um, the timeline for getting the remaining analysis completed. Um, but hopefully at one of the, the coming council meetings, we'll be ready to uh, share with the council uh, the schedule that we're looking at for the final EIS. And I would say- I'm oh, sorry, oh, go ahead. Uh, I'll go ask your question. Go ahead. No, I, I just would. I guess what I'm looking at is uh, I hope there would be a reasonable amount of time between when a final SEPA analysis is available to the council and when we have to make our recommendation to the governor, and that that's not so tight that we don't have enough time to adequately consider the EIS and the the final determination. You are absolutely correct, and as chair. That's my concern as well. Yeah, and, and I want to jump in. This is Judge Torum. Uh, Councilmember Young, this is the primary concern so that there's not a, any viability or I don't know what the right word is, just vulnerability to a remand from the Supreme Court that we did not give adequate consideration when we made our recommendation to the governor. And any party that might challenge this council's decision, if it seems too rushed, we're not gonna look good. And as Chair Drew said, we can work with the applicant, but right now we have to work with July 8th. That's, July, that's true. July 8th for the recommendation of the governor? That's currently the deadline, because right. if you look at the second extension request that was approved by this council, that's when we extended it. Now, again, let's be fair to the, what the statute says, Council Member Young, 12 months Right. Uh, is what is notionally involved. And we know that this project came to the council on February 8th of 2021. And right. I will do public math and say that we've exceeded 12 months already by a lot. Yeah. So the, the applicant, we have a duty to them as well, but a duty to the public and a duty to the governor. These are competing issues. And the July 8th date is something that um, that's as far as we have right now. If more can be negotiated or uh, applied for by the applicant. I'm sure the council will grant more time, but the applicant has a right to a decision and a recommendation in a timely fashion. Yeah, sure, I'm, I'm not. I'm not necessarily alluding to uh, extending that July 8th deadline. Maybe that's possible or necessary. Maybe it's not. But what I, I guess I'm getting at is, if July 8th is our working deadline, then uh, the SEPA work would or should be completed reasonably before that July 8th deadline so we can fully consider a completed SEPA analysis when when making our recommendation to the governor. I couldn't agree more fully and I am alluding to an extension request. I've done it with the parties at the pre-hearing conference on that record and I'll do it again today unless the council wants to go 24-7 at the end of June. July 8th is looking like a really tight deadline to me to have an issue recommendation to the governor that's defensible. Thank, thank you for that clarity. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, as part of this update, I also want to 
give you an update on consultation with the Yakima Nation. As you perhaps know, FSEC statute in RCW 805060 sub 8 requires FSEC to offer government to government consultation with affected tribes during the energy facility application review process. The statute also requires that regular updates be provided to the council by the FSEC chair throughout the tribal consultation process. And the chair represents the council during the process, but is responsible for providing that information back to the council. With that, I have an update on the Horse Heaven application review concerning the government to government consultation process. As you are already aware from prior staff project updates, FSEC staff have been in communication with staff from the Yakima Nation regarding the Horse Heaven application for site certification, review, and preparation of the draft environmental impact statement. On March 7th, I, as the FSEC chair, met with the Yakima Nation Council, Tribal Council Chair Lewis, Tribal Council, General Council, and staff, along with several members of the FSEC staff, to conduct a government-to-government -government consultation meeting for the Horse Heaven Wind Farm application for site certification. This consultation meeting provided a meaningful opportunity to better understand the concerns of the Yakima Nation and will be considered in addition to public comments received on the DEIS and will help to inform the SEPA review process for the Horse Heaven ASC. The issues that were raised have a connection to the draft EIS. And so at this point, we are looking for those issues as we continue to explore them with the Yakima Nation to be brought back to the council, perhaps with the final EIS. If not, there will be additional information that, that uh, I provide to you um, on the conclusion of that consultation. Are there any questions for me? Thank you. Thank you for the questions for the information for the ro robust conversation on this really um, critical point during this project review. Moving on to the Goose Prairie Solar Project update, Ms. Randolph. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Drew, council members and staff. For the record, this is Sarah Randolph, the site specialist for Goose Prairie facility. SX staff are continuing to receive and review documents being sent by the certificate holder for pre-construction plans. Are there any questions? Hearing none, thank you for that update. On Badger Mountain, Ms. Snarsky. Thank you, Chair Drew, and good afternoon, council members and staff. This is Joanne Snarsky for the record. Just after your February council meeting, we received a partial response from the applicant on our first of two data requests. We hope to have both data requests completed in the next few weeks, or excuse me, the next week. The data and information we requested will be reviewed and support the development of the draft environmental impact statement. That is currently in progress. Staff are working closely with our contractor and contracted agencies and the applicant to support a thorough evaluation of the potential impacts from the project and identify appropriate mitigation for those impacts. Are there any questions? Are there any questions for Ms. Snarsky? Thank you for your report. High Top and Austria projects, Ms. Hofgemeier. Thank you and good afternoon, Chair Drew and Council and staff. For the record, this is Amy Hofgemeier. Following the February 15th Council meeting, FSEC staff sent the recommendation package to the Governor's Office on February 17th. The Governor's Office has 60 days to review the Council's recommendation 
and staff anticipate that we will know the result of that review by the April 18th deadline. Are there any questions? Any questions? Okay, thank you. Watoma Solar Project Update, Mr. Caputo. Thank you, Chair Drew and Council Members. Last month, FSEC received the applicant's response to our data request number two. Presently, we are assessing the information with our consultant, coordinating with the appropriate state agencies, and collaborating with tribal nations. We anticipate updating the Council on the CEPA determination at the next Council meeting. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, thank you. Moving on to the Hop Hill Solar Project, Mr. Barnes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Drew and Council Members. For the record, this is John Barnes, FSEC staff for the Hop Hill application. On March 10th, FSEC received a cultural resource report from the applicant, which is available for Council review in the Council SharePoint. We are continuing to coordinate and review the application with our contractor and contracted agencies. Are there any questions? Questions? Okay. Thank you. Moving on to Carragher Solar, Ms. Snarski. Thank you, Chair Drew. Again, this is Joanne Snarski for the record. On March 8, 2023, staff sent out the in initial notification letter for the project. This included notification to residents and property owners within a one mile radius of the proposed project. The notice provided an overview of the project and location and identified the FSEC webpage where they can receive more detailed information. Staff have also begun to review the application for the site certification and are working with our contractor and contracting agencies to identify any missing or necessary supplemental information. Finally, staff are working to confirm a final date and location for the upcoming informational meeting and land use hearing. We hope to confirm the date by the beginning of next week. Upon completion, we will again notify all the interested parties with this information. Tentatively, it looks as if April 13th will be the date for those meetings. That's all I have. Any questions? Any questions from council members? Hearing none, um, before we move to adjourn the meeting, I would like to um, speak to my personal um, congratulations to Patty Betts, longtime member of our staff and our SEPA lead, who is finally retiring once again, having worked for multiple state agencies in her career only to retire and come back to work uh, with FSEC for close to 10 years, I believe, um, to help us with our as our SEPA lead through the projects that have come forward. We have relied for many years on Patty's wisdom, knowledge, her spirit of working with everyone, sharing the information she has developed over a long and illustrious career, and her love of her horses and her uh, life in uh, Thurston County, and she's going to have a lot more time to spend in the way she wants to, but uh, we will sincerely miss her on our staff. So congratulations to Patty Betts. Thank you. And with that, our meeting is adjourned.